Steel is a is a national or a nationalized industry in a lot of countries, uh, including China, which, and I'll just say a word about China because that's where most of the competition is for coming from today. Uh, almost half of all the steel produced in the world is made in China. China brought on more steel capacity in the last four years than the United States has, period. So it brought on more steel capacity just in the last four years than the U.S. has existing capacity right now. So you see how much it's grown. Um, there is it. Why is China doing this? Because it's a. I mean, there's a high demand for development in China, but they've also identified it as part of their five-year plan as being a strategically significant industry that employs a lot of people. In a typical Chinese steel mill, you'll find 30,000 workers. And so it is an employment project in, in China as much as a product making uh, uh, project. I don't know if you guys saw this, it, it was recently in the news, they attempted to close down a steel mill in China. Literally 30,000 workers revolted, killed the plant manager. Okay. Needless to say, the plant's still open. Um, but it's a, you know, they don't have unions. But there's, but just looking at the price point then. So, you can make it more efficiently in the United States. Why is there such a, why, why is the industry in trouble? And why have we seen the problems that we've seen recently? China get, gives massive subsidies to its steel industry uh, in the form of coal, natural gas, coking, uh, iron ore, <coughs> other sorts of things. Uh, they, they are able to get it at below cost uh, for a number of different reasons. Um, uh, reason number two. Uh, the industry is largely nationalized in China. That is, it's partially or wholly owned by the Chinese government. Uh, so they're able to dump a bunch, a bunch of money in uh, to make it uh, to make up for any inefficiencies that it may have. Um, there's obviously a wage disparity in China, but labor costs amount to less than 10 percent of the overall cost, overall cost of a of, of steel produced. So. It's not as big of a factor. What is a bigger factor, though, is environmental compliance. I mean, the, you heard obviously the you know the, the company line, uh, but it's also true about the uh, the environmental compliance costs and the energy efficiency gains that they've been able to make here. Well, in China, the the regulations and keep in mind that carbon is not a regulated pollutant yet, but you can still draw comparisons to carbon. But in things that are regulated, like particulate matter. Uh, uh, sulfur dioxide, nit nitrous oxides, the standards in China are six to twenty times weaker than they are in the United States. Uh, the fine structure is, you, you, there's a, the maximum fine that a Chinese steel facility could get for any number of violations of its uh, air or water laws is a total of $14,000. Yes. And when you keep in mind that you can make a ton of steel and sell it for about seven hundred dollars, it's easy to figure out the <laughs> the economics there. Uh, even that pathetic amount is rarely ever collected. In fact, uh, in in I think less than twenty percent of the cases it is a fine ever collected in China. By contrast, you know if U.S. Steel or any steel manufacturer has a violation of the Clean Air Act, they're subject up to a thirty-two thousand dollar a day fine. So there is, there is a disincentive written into U.S. law to pollute, and we're all glad about that. But there's a, that creates a massive, so the environmental compliance costs that they have at a facility like Edgar Thompson uh, per ton of steel adds on to the cost significantly. Here, here's, the other, here's the other main factor that's contributed to things. Chinese steel is dumped at below market rates into the U.S. market. They've identified... Uh, for instance, uh, oil oil pipe as being a strategic market for Chinese steel, and so even though they don't make it very competitively, they they try to sell it at the at the U.S. market at, at what we call a dumped price, which is below what it costs to make or below what the market will bear, and you know that that drives U.S. steelmakers out of business. Um, that's, that's technically a violation. It's technically a violation of of its trade agreements. That's right. The, the last factor, and this is sort of a, a, a meta factor, is the exchange rate. And uh, there is, it's a bit of an esoteric issue, but it's an important one, that Chinese steel coming in has about a, um, right now, about a 30% advantage 
uh, based on price because of the exchange rate manipulation that occurs in China. The yuan is valued about 30% less than it otherwise should be if it floated freely on the market. China tightly manages its currency in order to do that. It's a very mercantilist policy. should be illegal. You guys may remember that Tim Geithner, when he was uh, uh, before his, his nomination hearings in the Senate, admitted, he said, yeah, actually China does manipulate its currency, and everyone freaked out because, you know, it, it, there had been a tacit acknowledgement, but a, an incoming Treasury Secretary hadn't said that, even though it's true. He later backtracked. The, 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 the Obama administration, the first opportunity they had, did not cite China as a currency manipulator, which would set into motion a whole bunch of different processes to try to negotiate an agreement with China on that. But it's a so right 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 there you have a thirty percent price advantage that Chinese steel has because of because of the exchange rate issue. So you add all that up, it's difficult to compete. Uh, even if you make steel more efficiently, even if it's a better quality product, even if it's closer to market.